Hey folks, before you jump into this discussion with Rob Simetz and Shane Burley, I just want to provide just a little bit of context about how this came about. So uh, Rob is the host of Moving Forward on the Progressive Radio Network. We have been friends for a little while, and we decided that I was going to fly to Portland and that we were going to conduct two joint interviews that we would release both respectively on each of our platforms, his show Moving Forward and on mine, Last Born in the Wilderness. Uh, So we first met with Dar Jamal, who is a staff reporter for Truthout and just released the book, The End of Ice. I recommend that if you are at all interested about abrupt climate change, um, how to come to terms with the information that is presented within not only Dar's work, but all the scientists that he speaks to in his excellent book, The End of Ice, I recommend that you check out that interview. You can find it on my YouTube channel and on Rob's YouTube channel. I'll provide links to his work so you can find his stuff and, and where to find everything about Dar Jamal as well. But we spoke with uh, with Shane Burley that same day. We had set up a, a time, and Rob and I had both spoken with Shane previously on each of our respective uh, programs. So it was finally just a great thing to not only meet Dar, but then to meet Shane, who is an excellent uh, journalist. He's a he's has a really just a really good way of analyzing all these various political and social trends that we really need to pay pay attention to. Something that Rob and I talked about, I I believe in the interview, but we talked about it especially leading up to it, that we really wanted to talk about the rise of far right populism and violence in a time of accelerating. Uh, climate crisis, ecological crisis, you know, in a time when everything seems to be radically changing, uh, the far right has a very finely tuned narrative. And they tend to pull in a lot of people into their, uh, into their end of the political and social spectrum. And in order to understand why that's the case, we decided to sit down with Shane and unpack a lot of different subjects, in particular a, a article that he had released not very long ago uh, in Commune magazine. The title of that is A History of Violence, and the subtitle to that is Behind Every Lone Wolf, There is a Wolf Pack. James Alex Fields is a murderer. They are all murderers. So in that, he analyzes the the case of James Alex Fields, who was found guilty uh, for the murder of Heather Heyer, uh, she was at the Charlottesville uh, counter demonstration, the rally against uh, Unite the Right, which was a again a uh, something that happened back in 2017 in Charlottesville, where there was hundreds of, of far right groups, or I should say, hundreds of far right individuals within various far right groups trying to to develop a platform from them for them all to adopt and to work under. Um, ultimately, that backfired, and uh, the murder of Heather Hare by uh, James Alex Fields driving his car through a crowd of protesters, uh, that was a big part of why that happened, of why there was this backlash against the alt-right, against these far-right groups that would fit maybe under the alt-light and the alt-right and the white supremacists and far-right right nationalists. I mean, whatever category or subcategory they all fit within, uh, their movement was set back. But like all movements that exist on the far-right, as disorganized as they may be right now and as many setbacks as they have ultimately um, experienced in the past couple of years, we still need to pay attention. We still need to understand why they're still very popular, why there are still these individuals like James Alex Fields and so many others that would be called and have been labeled by the mainstream press as lone wolves. You know, why is it that we call them lone wolves? You know, and as Shane gets into, you know, behind every lone wolf, there's a a wolf pack. So, we need to pay attention to these subjects. So this conversation spans a lot of different subjects from from the intellectual dark web uh, to uh, the, you know, the sort of pseudoscience around race theory, like the bell curve um, and the sort of myths and and false science, I should say, or false set of data that is still being uh, passed around these sort of far right uh, white supremacist, uh, alt light, or or whatever brand of conservatism or right wing ide- ideology it tends to fit within, uh, there's still a lot of misinformation that is still getting passed around as scientific fact. So it was really a great thing to meet Shane, to meet Rob, to be able to do this joint, these two joint interviews with Rob, and and for him to have it released on his platform as well. Uh, I will just say here, if you want to learn more about Shane Burley, you can go to his website, shaneburley.net. A lot of the information you need is there. He's on Twitter. He has his book, 
And I, I would just recommend that people go check out Shane. Just look him up. He has an amazing articles that he puts out fairly regularly on various platforms, including the one I mentioned from Commune Magazine. Uh, I just recommend that people really support Shane and what he's doing. He's providing excellent analysis into a lot of these subjects. So without any further delay, here is my joint interview with Rob Simetz. I think I think our interview with Dar went really well. I'm really yeah. happy with that. But it's uh, again, it's it was like my I I've I fucked up interviews not on purpose to the what I mean is I've had such te- bad technical glitches before where I've lost you know someone's audio oh, completely. Oh, I I I was doing this documentary and I had it was a bunch of interviews Noam Chomsky, oh, um, you... Elizabeth Warren and I knocked the hard drive off the desk and I lost them. Oh wow! Luckily, Noam Chomsky let me just come back. <laughs> you talked to input. Noam Chomsky, though. Oh yeah, that's oh, yeah. crazy. But that's awesome. I had Elizabeth Warren on there, and and that was before she ran for governor or whatever. It was about the financial crisis. Okay. So I was like, she had done a lot about housing stuff. So I was sure. Well, that's cool. Yeah, I I've always wanted to talk with Noam. He was like the guy that got me like when I was a teenager, and I was, I think I think it was like I was like fifteen. 14 and i was starting to kind of get a little bit of an understanding of of um I, I, the first thing that got me actually was libertarianism because i because i was in idaho and and ron paul was running <laughs> right, remember ron yeah. paul the ron paul revolution right, yeah. Right. Oh, yeah yeah that was a big deal you it know was, it totally was and he was saying shit you know in these national debates with republicans like we need to get out of we need to get out of iraq we need to stop having all these military bases around yeah, the world these yeah. anti-intervention and intervention audit audit uh the the federal reserve yeah, yeah. you know and this, i didn't have any like substantial critiques of capitalism sure, i didn't sure, yeah. understand that at the time so i remember um yeah, like just being kind of interested in that. And I even saw him, he came to the town I live in, Twin Falls. He came to Twin Falls and spoke at the local auditorium, the high school auditorium there. With a packed crowd? Yeah. I bet. There were a lot of teenagers there with yeah. his books. Like they love yeah. them, you know. And um, and then uh, around 16-ish, I don't know when, I, I just started getting into like, I found about Noam Chomsky. And I read uh, Hegemony or Survival. And then I read Failed States. Actually, I'm going to plug that phone in real quick before I forget. But, um, yeah, it was, like, kind of kind of crazy. Like, I started to really get a grasp of American foreign policy at that point, and that yeah. was, like, my entry into radical politics. Yeah, you could probably have them on the show. Like, I mean, I've tried... The, the difficulty is always trying to get contact information. Like, I... I'll also do it over the... Con- I mean, like, it's... I think it's still just the public MIT one that he was using. Yeah. He, uh, like, when I was there... It was like, it's like every time I've been there, it's like I sit down in a room and there's like people and then they're like next person, then the yeah. next person. That's crazy. Um, it was like someone doing a documentary on <laughs> Sheriff Arpaio. Uh-huh. And then like right afterwards, like his assistant, because that was the deal. Like the assistant's like, I'm going to tell you you're done. When I say you're done, you're fucking done. Don't try again another question in. You're done. So when she came in, she's like, you're done. He's like. You're done, and like he's like, and then like then she brought in a phone. And he's like, "L.A. Times." I gotta go to the next one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. If you want to maybe hold your microphone just slightly, there we go. How about that? That's perfect. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I'm so I. It's just yeah. No, no good. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess we'll just start. I mean, I just think there's a lot of there's a lot to talk about. You you explore a lot of nuanced subjects, and and while it can start from kind of analyzing far right movements. We can go in so many directions, and I think you and I both have notes. We have ideas. I pull my laptop and we'll uh, look at some stuff. But you know, I mentioned uh, the recent piece you did in Commune Magazine, mm-hmm. really interesting. I know you t- did a really good podcast with um, Comrades and Coffee. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. And that was a great interview. I think that one did probably a, a really good analysis of, of what you uh, explored in that subject in that to- in that uh, article. But I, I think in particular, um, because both of us, uh, you know, explore climate change and stuff like that, I think having you on today and, and, and having had that interview earlier today with Dar Jamal, that's fresh in our minds. And, and of course, we're thinking about how our, our culture, how our particular society and Western societies in particular are going to have to deal with, are going to politically and are currently politically dealing with 
abrupt climate change. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to be this like, oh, let's all come into a state of healing and love. No, no. I mean, we want that. That's <laughs> That's what we want. But I mean, in reality, we're going to see, and we are seeing for a far right insurgency in, in many in many cases. Um, I don't even know. Did you have a, like a first question you well, wanted to throw at Shane before I, I, just, I rant at him? Just a general question is, as I've been exploring your work more and Jason Wilson and Matthew Lyons is, what at least my interpretation of some of the things I'm seeing with the far right is that um, they're they're similar in a sense of people that consider themselves on the left. As far as we see something wrong with society, but we have way different things of what we see that's wrong, mm -hmm. and way different solutions. Obviously, or different ways we want to attack it. But there's this inner you know, I don't know how to look, maybe it's consciously or subconsciously, we know something's not right. And what I worry about, and what I realize with listening to Coffee with Comrades, with your interview, with reading Insurgent Supremacists mm. with from Matthew Lyons, is that it seems like there's um, a lot of things that they say that could be anti-establishment, considered that on the surface, and that sucks people into the trap. And as far as they tell a half truth. Like for instance, I was listening to uh, David Ru Dave Rubin, and I was listening to Stefan. What's his last name again? Stefan Molyneux. Yeah, yeah. Stefan Molyneux. Stephon Molyneux. Yeah. yeah, and the way they led the interview was talking about how Hollywood is morally bankrupt, yet they act like they're morally superior. I mean, who doesn't agree with that? A lot of people do. And then next thing you know, thirty-two minutes later, they're talking about race and IQ mm -hmm. and how. Uh, Austra indigenous people from Australia have the smallest brains and the smallest IQ. I mean, we go from that to something that extreme in, in about 32-minute segment. So is there things you see when you're doing all this research that you say, that's a trap, don't fall into that trap. We can't let people on the left fall into that trap. Yeah, I mean, the the real... The real thing that I think we should avoid is determining what's useful or what's politically viable based on kind of our, our gut first instinct, because there's a lot of agreement across people that really doesn't define anything. So like before the, the podcast started, we were talking about Ron Paul. And so like Ron Paul comes out, the Ron Paul revolution, talking about ending the war, um, talking about vague police state stuff little bit against you know government uh, interventions there was you know different kind of vague things that most people would agree with i would agree with you know i remember my my dad really liking that thinking wow this guy's great like look at what he's saying but let's really think about what ron paul says at his fundamental core i mean why is ron paul against foreign intervention and in, in conflict well he he's against it from an isolationist perspective well, I'm not an isolationist. I don't want to just isolate myself off in some kind of economic or, or civic nationalism. Um, I'm against intervention because it's crushing people of color in the global south. Um, that's not the same reason as Ron Paul. You know, you know, like I agree with Pat Buchanan that we shouldn't be in X, Y, and Z war, but that's not, not for the same reason. And so the first, you know, the first thing that someone says there, the first anti-establishment impulse is not necessarily where we find agreement. I don't agree with someone simply because we're both against the state. There's a lot of reasons to be against the state or against capital or to fight your boss. I mean, there's a lot of reasons to do that. But I think it's it's actually in the more nuance that we find where we actually have agreements in. You know, it's it's about what the fundamental drives we have, what are our underlying values? And if those are about democracy and equality, they're just fundamentally not the same thing that what Ron Paul feels or what Pappy Cannon feels or definitely what Stefan Molyneux feels. But, yeah, I was going to say, like, I before I really got into the values of, say, Stefan Molyneux, I was watching his videos. Mm -hmm. It's interesting, like, how it pulls people in from all across the spectrum into into their gravity, you know? Yeah. Like, Stefan Molyneux does a lot of stuff on childhood development, which is super mm -hmm. interesting. He talks about, you know, how to... Pro and I mean, in, in a very real way, he talks about the proper way to raise a child in a non-abusive way. Because I think, from what I understand, from Stefan Molyneux's perspective, I mean, from, from his life, he, he himself, I think, was abused as a child. So he has this understandable you know concern for how to raise a child in a very um you know non-coercive way you know and kind of going up against some of the the common assumptions that people still have about rearing children 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and I could be wrong on that, but I remember watching some of his videos like years ago and being like, this guy's interesting. You know, okay, I agree with that. And then you get into like, <laughs> then you said, I was, I sent you that video yeah. of, of him on, on the Rubin report going, and he's like, oh, I just hate, I just hate that this is the reality. I hate that this is the way it is. Mm-hmm. But you know, people from this and this place with this and this ethnic background and this and this genetic makeup, they just have lower IQs. And we really need to, we really need to address that. We right. have to talk about why, you know, black people are stuck in this rut of poverty. We have to talk about why, you know, and again, he's, and he said explicitly in that interview that we're talking about here, it's the bell curve, you know, yeah. and you and yeah. I talked about that in our first interview yeah. together. And, and that actually, I got some interesting comments, people saying that's not a legitimate argument. And that was a whole other thing. And I, and I message you once, like, I'm like, dude, what are some great critiques that you've seen of the bell curve? Why is that argument, that uh, book or whatever, still such a, uh, you know, still used to this day? It's fascinating. I don't know if you had any way to. Yeah, I mean, that. it's still used because people want something to use. You know, like if it wasn't the bell curve, they would go something else. There was a, a book that came out just a couple of years ago called The Troublesome Inheritance. I don't know if you heard about it. It was actually a pretty popular book um, uh, by a, a science, a popular science journalist. Mm-hmm. And it made essentially this, a lot of the same arguments that the bell curve did, except like it said that, you know, personality types and, and other kinds of factors are created um, by regionality ev- and recent evolution. So basically racial differences. They didn't really talk about IQ. They talked about, you know, temper mentality and, and other things. Mm-hmm. Um, but what people want is they want something that's going to validate these things because they have a gut feeling about it. That gut feeling is implanted by years and years of racist training, but it makes sense to them. So when Stefan Molyneux says that, he's ignoring 95% of research that doesn't prove that. That actually proves that these are really pseudoscientific concepts. The IQ does not develop in that way and it doesn't signify intelligence in that way. Um, and it's a lot easier than to kind of feed what he's already feeling and to, to dig into that. You know, the bell curve itself is, I think, we'll look back on with a lot of wonder about how that really came into the public culture and what it really meant. Because what it does is make gigantic leaps um, about like wealth and how societies are created and how societies transfer wealth and sustain themselves based on these really strange psychometric readings. Um, And by using research that's been wholly debunked and was funded by neo-Nazis. And so like the question I think is what, is the function of these to people? You know, what are they getting out of them and why are they ignoring the broad science? Someone like Stefan Molyneux exists in a kind of weird space that couldn't have existed four or five years ago before we had internet media that kind of looks good and has the ability to sustain itself financially. And what he does is try and fill a gap that mainstream media, quote unquote, doesn't do, which is creating this kind of alternative viewpoint. And he does that by mining basically alt science and basically, you know, making these arguments that wouldn't fit in any other uh, sphere. So, like, Stephen Molyneux is not a geneticist. He's not out there talking about, like, what actual psychometric readings are and what how evolutionary science works. Most people would debunk that. Instead, what he is is a person that talks at a camera. And that plays really well with a certain subset of his audience because that's what they want. Yeah. And so the bell curve and all these kind of pseudoscientific arguments work because people want them to work. It reminds me of it, like, sorry to interrupt you. Mm-hmm. No, it's like Jordan Peterson, you know, like Jordan Peterson is still very popular. I, I have friends who I love and they love Jordan Peterson yeah. and it gets a little annoying because it's hard to take him seriously when he uses the analogy of lobster hierarchies to kind of justify human hierarchy. Yeah. And it's weird, you know, and his whole argument is that hierarchy is deeper than all of these human systems like, uh, you know, capitalism, the state, uh, patriarchy, all these things. Like, those are natural. They come about from a natural, what, uh, evolutionary process. And, right, right. And he, te- again, he tends to ignore the fact that using lobsters is a really weird metaphor. I don't <laughs> fucking understand the lobster thing. Like, you could have picked that's something That's a, a Petersonism, lot. Yeah. yeah. He could have used something so much better that's so much closer to human beings. Like, he could have at least stuck, stayed in, like, the, the ape, you know, <laughs> spectrum here. But he didn't. He chose fucking lobsters. It doesn't make sense to me. But, you know, I, I think that these individuals like Stefan Molyneux uh, and, and Peterson, and we can point to all these kind of alt-light, if you could use that for... Maybe maybe that isn't the you right You know, category. I actually think that, that Peterson, 
Steven Pinker. There's a number of them. Um, I think they've been called kind of the intellectual dark web. I think it's a yeah. word that's been going around. Yeah, yeah. That's I, a good I, description. I think of it as the academics that circle around Joe Rogan for some reason. Yes. Yep. Um, yep, yep. And I, I, I don't think they're all – I think they're just something else entirely. Um, but yeah. they are kind of this cadre of quote unquote dissenting academics. <laughs> you know, academics for sanity. It's just this crazy PC academic world uh, if it wasn't for these guys. Uh, but yeah. again, they fill that kind of space of, of kind of pseudo intellectualism or really kind of boiled down intellectualism to this discussion about kind of broad social issues. So like Peterson's not an expert on, on you know, human social systems. He never claimed to be yet. He's writing these elaborate things about how we should justify hierarchy by looking at shellfish. Like it's bizarre, <laughs> but it gets a lot yeah. of online views and it gets a huge following. So, you know, yeah. when he has a Patreon where he's making, you know, half a million dollars a year, yeah. like it's not really based on being like deep intellectual. It's based on repackaging an intellectual veneer and making really simplistic arguments that appeal to a kind of moderately right base that are just kind of pissed off with the left online. There was um, an interview I saw him give, and it was from somebody in, in, in England, and maybe it's with the BBC, I don't know. It's the, it's the interview that went viral where he, yeah. he yeah. watched him slam this woman about how there's it's okay for gender inequality for pay. And what I noticed is they take that clip as like a it was like the buzz clip or, you know, for a, sh- a screenshot in time to, for people to, to watch and, and, and listen to. But throughout that whole interview, she tried to pin him down on his beliefs and he kept dancing out of it. He's a guy you cannot pin down. I mean, that's what I find so concerning with some of this stuff is when you try to have conversations with people like this is they have a psychological game to it that I would come in with the intention of, here's my ideas, I'm genuinely telling you my ideas, and let's have, here's my ideas, here's your ideas, let's let somebody decide what they feel about it. But they're not doing that. There's a manipulation, There's it's a game to them, it's a game that they must win. Mm-hmm. And I feel like he's one of those people. I mean, I think there's an advantage for Peterson to dance around what he really believes. I mean, let's put it out there. So he's talking about hierarchy. He's talking about gender differences. That's not that far different from racial differences. And I think that, if he was to be totally frank about it, or if he was to go the full measure, he'd be more like Stefan Molyneux, who is not invited to universities to speak, who's not going to sell out, you know, these big venues where he's having these speaking events. Um, and so there's a real advantage to basically stoking the same kind of venom that Molyneux does, but being able to say like, hey, I'm just talking about social systems and, and then, you know, why, and then switch the conversation. Why are you silencing me? Don't you want to have a debate? Let's just have a conversation. Yeah, you know, and, and this this kind of leads into uh, your article in Commune magazine, uh, A History of Violence. And so just recently, uh, James Alex Fields, he had a trial recently, and he was convicted for his murder, I believe. I, I, I didn't really yeah. follow that particular case very closely. I knew about it, of course. Um, but he was the one that, that was at Charlottesville, uh, was with part of the Unite the Right rally, uh, drove his car into a crowd of people, killed Heather Hare. Uh, and uh, now is on trial for that. And, and from what I understand, that the, the the trial or the various charges against him that that hasn't been fully concluded yet. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think there's the question of civil rights violations and okay. terrorism charges. I would have to go back and look at what the federal prosecution actually looks like, but it could result in enhancements. And so I don't think the the conversation is over. I think it's about a debate about whether there's life in prison or. If death penalty is on the ca- on the table i'd have to go look at the specifics of it but it's about that okay and and what you did in that piece is you discussed the the, the complex i guess of, of these individuals i mean he's not the first person who's been um i guess you could say radicalized or or maybe maybe that's not the right word but you know as a part of this sort of he's considered a lone wolf right mm-hmm. this idea of this person who was mentally unstable or, or something. He was drawn to the movement. He didn't really have any real associations with any of the major groups that were that were at the rally. Um, and while there is certainly defenders that would say that, oh, he was being intimidated by the crowd that was surrounding his car. He was acting as, you know, maybe as irrational, but he did something that made sense in a certain kind of way. Um, you know, we see this over and over again, and that's what you did a really good job, job in this piece is just you get into the pattern of these things 
And if you don't mind, I would like to quote something from that sure. piece just to get some context here. It says, there exists a reliable pattern inside of American white nationalism. Rising to visibility through hot button issues, fascists will see a moment of skyrocketing influence and use it to latch onto a slightly more moderate right-wing movement so as to gain influence and recruit. During the civil rights movement, explicit na- racialists, excuse me, and the Ku Klux Klan used pro-segregationist movement use the pro-segregationist movement and the white citizens councils to gain respectability with Jim Crow Southerners and to expand the Overton window with regards to race. In the 1880s, it was paleoconservatism, a more old right version of republicanism that rejected the internationalist and neoliberal neoconservatism that gave the extreme right access to the conservative base, particularly uh, through figures like Pat Buchanan. More recently, it has been the internet celebrity c- uh, c- cater of uh, civic nationalists, often referred to as the alt light, consisting of people like Jack, is it Posobiec? Posobiec. Posobiec, thank yeah. you. Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, Alex Jones, and Lauren Southern. Uh, open fascism is generally seen as contemptible by most of the public when presented on its own. With a friendlier partner, however, however, fascists can slowly normalize their politics and grow their ranks. So I know we were just sort of talking about these, like, kind of, they're not particularly necessarily fit within the alt-light or alt-right, especially. But I do think, like we were discussing like earlier before the recording, like people getting into libertarianism, for instance, with, say, a Ron Paul election, mm-hmm. or a Ron Paul uh, presidential election uh, campaign, excuse me. Um, this doesn't necessarily lead to say joining the militia movement (laughs) this doesn't necessarily mean they're going to join some alt-right group some white supremacist group but again if you kind of dig into it a little bit you see how that's a gateway to for a lot of people Mm -hmm. i could see yeah um and maybe that's saying a lot for some of these people like i I don't think people that like jordan peterson necessarily are going to jump on the you know richard spencer bandwagon anytime soon but but you pointed to in that uh, that essay in that article there's a particular pattern within the alt-right and far-right movements. They legitimize their presence by latching onto less extreme versions of basically what they believe. Right. And yeah, if you just wanted to kind of unpack what I kind of quoted there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, radical movements in general kind of need to do this. There has to be some way of bridging in. It really depends on on how they see themselves functioning. And the alt-right is confused in a lot of ways. Are they a revolutionary movement? Are they one that wants to get electoral reforms? So do they, you know, want to go step by step? Do they want catastrophic events? It's always like kind of unsure. But what they do want more than anything is to speak to people, to change minds, to scrape people off the service who are ready to go, and to move other people along. And so what they do is the same thing that white nationalist groups have done for decades decades, which is to find something that has common cause with them and to kind of move through them. So if you look at the clan that had like the, what I mean is the third era clan of the, the, the 40s, 50s and 60s. Um, this is really the came about in the South is a, almost a paramilitary movement against desegregation, especially in the deep South. Um, and what it needed was some way to, to connect with other people. So outside of North Carolina, it didn't really have huge, huge, huge numbers. And so what it needed to do was basically find a way of pushing a really militant pro-segregationist message into the mainstream. And it did that by allying with uh, white citizens councils, basically community groups that were concerned citizens against desegregation. That was a way of essentially mainstreaming their ideas of a really militant Jim Crow. And this happens again in stages throughout the years. Now, once you hit about the late 70s and 80s, there's definitely a shift in the white power movement to being a little bit more openly revolutionary. But there's still a large portion of it that needs that crossover thing. They have to be able to speak to people. And they do that by coding it as issues of immigration, issues of, of Islam more recently, um, issues of PC culture, feminism, multiculturalism, affirmative action. There's all these sorts of things. And they can really hone in on them. In the ni- Starting in the 90s, it was really heavily focused on immigration. And they did that by really trying to tap into people who are already kind of edgy in their views. And that was people associated with libertarianism, libertarian parties and things like that. And people like Ron Paul. And so 
today there's a lot of anxiety over Islam. There's a lot of anxiety about immigration in large parts of the country, and they're able to just continually stoke that. And when you make immigration such a prime issue for people, when they become like, quote unquote, a single you know issue voter, like Ann Coulter likes to say about immigration, then why wouldn't you be a white nationalist? Because really what you're doing is fundamentally creating an entire political identity centered on keeping people who aren't like you out. And that's very, very mobilizing for people. And so when you focus in on that almost entirely, you're able to push almost the exact same worldview with different branding and different tribal affiliations. And so that's what they're able to do. And when you're able to do that, their movement isn't that far off and it's able to make gains. And they have made gains Mm -hmm. just by doing that. In a way, what they were trying to enter moved even further past them. Like those movements became so much more radical, they didn't even need the white nationalists anymore. They're just like blasting forward at this point. Mm. And so... One thing I wanted to ask you is, are you seeing, you're seeing really what you're tracing for us is a cycle of rebranding to come back. I mean, in the 90s, from what I remember reading was the decade, they really got pushed down. And now they've come back. And now we're at a stage where Gavin McGinnis has left the Proud Boys, the Unite the Right to uh, March, not even was a failure. Total. Um, and Richard Spencer can't get speaking gigs at colleges anymore. Mm-hmm. So where are they? What, what, where do things stand now with, with the movement? It's totally unsure. But I mean, unless there's some movement that actually crush it really effectively, I mean, it will just come back. Maybe even then. I mean, it's part and parcel for the underlying conditions of the society we live in. So it's not like um, we can just completely eradicate it without doing really, really fundamental work on changing society. Um, but yeah, they're in a really bad spot right now. Um, they've had really mass resistance to them. They've also done it to themselves. They were deplatformed themselves essentially by being such large buffoons and murderous assholes. <laughs> like they were, they were so effectively deplatformed that their media infrastructure, which really gave them a huge boost, is gone. Um, Richard Spencer, as a figurehead, was getting shut down so regularly. Also, having his own interpersonal problems, I'm sure, didn't help anything. Um, and so, yeah, they're really in a lot of disarray. What's scary about that, they have these these peaks and troughs all the time, so like, pretty much like any social movement in a way. This was a huge peak for them, but they are falling off that cliff very, very quickly, and that's when you see acts of like seemingly spontaneous violence. Um, it's when desperate people who have been giving essentially a revolutionary imperative, they have to do this, right? Immigration and white genocide create this kind of frantic response. Like, oh my God, we have to stop this. Oh my God, our society is going to fall apart. We're going to be eliminated. You give them that and then you give them no way forward because their movements failed. And so that's when you see the kind of catastrophic acts of violence. How they rebrand, it's, it's really hard to say. Um, the far right or radical right that's not just explicit white nationalists, those associated with Trump and other kind of far right outlets, Breitbart, they're doing just fine. Like they will continue forward. It's the explicit white nationalists that took the major hit and the more slightly more moderate far right kept going. So it's hard to see what the branding will look like. It could be that they they brand more revolutionary, that it goes more back to the white power roots. Um, It could be that they really double down on the Stephen Molyneux type of of trying to make it about media talking points and um, these more moderate outlets. But it's, it's really hard to say at this point. One question I wanted to ask you, and I thought you did a great job when I listened to the interview of uh, Coffee with Comrades, is this this dance that they do where they're the victim, they're they're through multiculturalism, they're the victim, but yet at the same time, it's this genetics that makes them superior. Mm-hmm. So how do they balance that to get to get people to tap into that kind of dance and that message that they're giving? Oh, Jews. I mean, Jews are the the uh, the answer to their unfinished equation. Nothing makes it, it, uh, Andrew Anglin and um, Greg Johnson, who runs Countercurrents Publishing. It's a big white nationalist kind of more like intellectual um, publishing house. They'll say it. This makes no sense. Nothing we're saying makes any sense without Jews. Jews are the answer to that question. Um, and so, what they're basically saying is that. As history goes on, it's the battle between nations and peoples. That's just normal parts of you know species fight, other species for hegemony and survival. And white people, as superior as they are, always won. 
that was until Jews get in there with their tribal interests and their very high verbal IQs, and they're able to use the genetic gifts that whites had against themselves. So whites have a high trust society, they'll often say. This is something Stefan Molyneux even talks about. Uh, this is part of the kind of intellectual pseudoscience, that they're able to you know, create these societies where they trust people, where they're able to uh, therefore create you know, advancements in science and things like that, except Jews will turn that against them, trick them, and therefore they'll use it against them. And they do that with multiculturalism, liberalism, feminism, Freudian psychology. I mean, honestly, over the eras, it changes somewhat. But no matter what the question is, the answer is Jews tricked white people. Which is why, going back to Dave Rubin's YouTube video, that he said the smart, smartest ethnicity was Jewish people, and that in particularly in verbal IQ. Yeah, I mean, and that's, I mean, the, the, the bell curve says the same thing. Ashkenazi Jews are the smartest. Yeah. Well, wh- what is the response then to someone who says that? Because I... I I'm not saying that I agree with that, but what I'm kind of asking, I guess, is if you have a test, an IQ test or whatever, whatever metrics they're using, and they may be completely valid scientific measurements. I could be wrong on saying that, but I don't know. I'm just saying like if there is a va- if there is a say, scientific measurement that shows that certain groups of people test higher on certain, say, uh, you know, uh, there's certain acuity, like they're, they're better at certain things, like like verbally, they're better, like you're just desc- describing mm-hmm. the, the Jews, right? And, of course, that could be twisted in so many ways. So, again, I guess I'm asking is, like, what would be the, the scient- a real scientist, I guess, that isn't trying to cherry-pick the data? What would they say is the reason for these discrepancies, the differences between certain groups of people? It's a huge range. I, 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 do, I should limit the amount I get into it versus, like, what? a geneticist or a psychiatrist would, would likely answer on some of those things. But there's a, a number of them. The first thing is that IQ is not a really great measurement of natural intelligence. There is some validity in, in measuring the naturalness of people's ability to, to recognize patterns, to solve abstract problems and things like that. But IQ can be generally affected by education levels, um, by access to nutrition, by a huge, huge, huge number of factors. Um, there's really dramatic cultural differences in how people solve the problems and things that are presented by IQ tests. And so IQ tests, I know that what, what uh, kind of racists like to do is try and say that there's nonverbal IQ tests that show the same results. It's not true. Um, and the reality is that people with a, a you know substantial graduate education, for example, score really high on IQ tests um, and scored low on them before that education. Uh, people that don't speak English tend to s- score much lower on those IQ tests, um, even when they're translated. There's a lot of things that kind of go into what the IQ test measures. When we're talking about the IQ tests that people generally ascribe to Ashkenazi Jews, um, they're talking about studies of testing basically Jewish graduate students with super high IQs and then looking at psychometric data from Africa from people that don't speak English and were just introduced with IQ tests quite often and then trying to compare those results, it just doesn't actually make sense. And they're also, I think what's, what's really important too when we're looking at what they say about IQ tests is how they explain these discrepancies. And so, for example, uh, J. Philippe Rushton, who was a really kind of big proponent of race and IQ, offers this idea that white people, because of cold climate, evolved to be much smarter problem solvers versus people in Africa, which totally kind of, if anyone's compared what Sweden is like, um, you know, geographically to central or sub-Saharan Africa, not exactly like one is just the hard place to live and the other one's just super easy. It really doesn't uh, put into calculation about how IQ is formed, I mean, how intelligence would be formed cognitively, um, how people solve problems. Uh, and it really, really undervalues any kind of form of social science and how it would actually explain how people develop culturally. So I, I think when we're looking at something like an IQ test, what is it really measuring? And how do we understand those kind of complexes today? It's very dramatically different. Yeah, it just seems like the IQ test is the only thing they're basing this on, right? I mean, is is there other other like metrics that they're basing it on, or is it? I mean, just even the IQ? more pseudoscientific things like criminality. For example, if you look back in the period of eugenics, there was this idea that criminality was like a character flaw that could be explained genetically. Mm. Now we understand what criminality has to do with social conditions, what society suspect of. Sus- expect of individuals, what their socioeconomic background is, what people do to survive, how they understand themselves, their identities, all kinds of things. And so 
when they look at those sorts of things, what they want to do is say that a certain type of personality comes from a certain region. Therefore, we can generalize pretty, you know, matter of factly. But the reality is that's not the case. There is no uh, temperance or IQ that can be ascribed to any group of people. There is no scientific evidence of that. There is some minor scientific evidence about, you know, families and, and maybe they score on, on a certain kind of rating. Even that's really highly adjustable based on their education and their environmental factors on how they were raised and things like that. But no, there really isn't any substantial information otherwise. And a lot of the tests and studies that, for example, were cited by the bell curve and are cited quite often were funded by, not, by essentially white nationalist um, funds, like the Pioneer Fund was formed in the 30s, basically to fund race science education. And so uh, we're talking about in the 40s, 50s, 60s, and 70s, studies like, for example, twin studies, which are supposed to compare the high heritability of IQ, was funded by the, this basically Nazi, Nazi research tank. And then that was uncritically used by a lot of people like, uh, like Charles Murray and the bell curve. And we're talking about Basically, studies are highly debunked. They are not used in any academic paper by professors who speak at American Renaissance. So when, we're, when we look at like what we think we know about IQ and how it affects societies, we're talking about really highly compromised research that's not generally accepted by anyone. I know we were talking about you know some of the theories that they have on brain size and particularly IQ, but what about DNA? I mean, I know that there was recently in the news, there's James Watson, who, what he discovered, the structure of DNA, who's come out and said about intelligent levels, intelligence levels with race and with white people compared to African people. Have they gone into as far as in depth and on, have they used that, his rhetoric to justify their beliefs? And also have they talked about DNA as a, as a way? So, I mean, they, they use James Watson a lot as the image of the embattled professor, He's just trying to speak truth, guys, and apparently that's illegal these days. Um, that's essentially how they treat James Watson. James Watson is a brilliant man, you know, in terms of sequencing the human genome and looking at the, the structure of DNA. There's no question of it. And it takes someone that smart to say something so fabulously stupid as what he said, which isn't based on any research he's ever done. It's his assumptions as a geneticist that so many things have to have a genetic root that he takes essentially a racial bias and gives it a deep thought explanation. And so, yeah, recently, you know, this happened in 2007 in an interview. He basically said that, that, he, Africa had gloomy prospects because of their low IQ, which he thought was genetic. And so then fast forward, PBS is doing a documentary about scientific masters, I think. So it's basically looking at his career and how he's always been kind of an asshole. That's kind of the story because it's not, this isn't the only time he said stuff like this. Um, and then when they ask him, do you still think that? He's like, yeah, I do still think that. I still think that it's genetic. I'm sorry. Um, and so, you know, he's had kind of even more of his titles stripped from him um, in the Research Institute where he did a lot of his genomic research. You know, that just fucks with, I think, a lot of people and how they view intelligence itself because mm -hmm. you have a person like him. He's a geneticist. He did groundbreaking scientific research with a couple other people, right? Won the Nobel Prize, like all this shit, all these credentials, mm -hmm. yeah. right? It also reminds me, I think I was talking to my friend the other day about this, uh, Ben Carson, who ran for uh, president the last election. What is he, right. a neurosurgeon or something? The best in the country. Yeah. Is that true? Oh, absolutely. And absolutely. And, I mean, he is unparalleled in science. And, if I had brain surgery, yeah. I would want it to be Ben Carson. And that's what <laughs> fucks with me, because he still believes in this like biblical creation story thing, and he like says some of the most like sexist shit. It's and just, some of the most buffoonish things yeah. I've ever heard Pull about history. Pull yourself up by your bootstraps, too. He's a big one on oh, that. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. And it's so perplexing. I think it fucks with us. And this, to me, is why I think... We shouldn't be using IQ to indicate, obviously, that – well, we shouldn't obviously equate it with morality. Uh, mm -hmm. That's definitely not the case. But especially, like, in certain kinds – I feel like intelligence is really a mosaic or a spectrum of things. It's not like, okay, you have a really high IQ. That means you understand all these different – components of society and how societies are structured and what's best for for a cult you know what i mean like there's that's what i think fucks with people and me too I, I get a little caught up in this idea of you know if there's a test that proves someone's super intelligent they're the best neurosurgeon in the country right. they must understand that the bible is not the best place to look for 
the evolutionary history of mankind or humankind, right? Right. You know what I mean? Like it just it it, it gets weird. But I think it reminds us that just because someone is a fantastic neuroscience doesn't mean that they can teach me about Egyptian history. You know? Yeah. yeah. Because Ben Carson, I mean, while he may be brilliant uh, when it comes to to you know, his surgical techniques, I mean, is falling for some of the most bizarre and silly explanations by history. Well, earlier, sorry, but earlier today we were talking about, um, we were talking about shit. I'm sorry. I'm blinking right now. I'm having a hard time with my brain right now. Fuck. <laughs> you go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll try to remember what I, I was going to say. Um, w- what I, I think this all speaks to is failure in our education system. <laughs> um, I think that we're an education system that we're designed to take a test and do well at a test right. and not critically think, and we're designed to be specialists. And that's exactly yeah, what Ben that's Carson what said, is. You just said everything. <laughs> yes. He's a specialist <laughs> yeah. in, in brain surgery, but it's just because he's a specialist in brain surgery doesn't mean he's a specialist in other areas. And that goes across the board for anybody. Yeah. Highly specialized um you know, forms of education, I guess that's what I was going to say. I totally blanked on that, but yeah. Yeah. Specialization, especially in a, in a kind of a capitalist society like our own where people, you know, like for instance, we don't know how to live off the land. We don't have to, but sure. we, but way we survive in this society and culture is like, I'm very good at making coffee and I'm going to be a barista. I'm very good. I went to school for eight to whatever amount of years to be a neurosurgeon i'm very 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 specialized in this thing trying to then use that kind of specialized intelligence to try to understand other complex things in the world doesn't always carry over yeah because i think there's a lack of i really hate to say critical thinking because it it sounds so kind of insulting we say but there is a certain inability to kind of differentiate between quality information and unquality at the same time as having a dramatic distrust in institutions which frankly is probably well deserved right and so when you're looking at something like stefan molyneux having a video about iq like i don't know i guess it sounds right there's a bunch of sciencey sounding word he has a thorough line you know it makes sense when he's saying it the problem is it's untrue right and i don't have the resources really to, to decode that i don't really understand that iq really measures a whole bunch of experiences you know some of them cognitive some of them you know having to do with uh, you know what kind of education i had and how i'm feeling right then there's a whole range of things that go into that i don't really know about that you know he's saying it's something that's that's uh, patentable and measurable and he's citing these scientists for it and i think that's true about you know kind of the world of conspiracy theories that's only growing where it's an attempt to really make sense of the world but not having a really clear picture of how these different systems work yeah i just wanted to ask um i think this is to kind of get back into i guess the far right and how they um i I think and i think you've you've pointed this in in uh previous interviews you've had um and i think you you pointed the, uh, the interview you did with comrades and coffee but the the fact is, is that, at least for me, and I talked about this whole Ron Paul thing when I was a kid, that was a big deal. That was a libertarian perspective. Free market capitalism is like the best system ever, and that's, that's, the, that's the epitome of freedom, right? Um, so we, I think we have, at least for me and people that are, I guess, of a leftist tendency, tend to think leftists are the only, one that, only ones that are critiquing capitalism, the only yeah. ones that think in an anti-capitalist fashion about these things. And what you point to, and you've pointed to in that previous interview I mentioned, uh, is actually when you get into white supremacist territory, like this ethno state kind of dream that a lot of these guys have, um, they are anti capitalist, but in a completely different way. If you could, I would love if you could unpack that. Yeah, there was this term that got floated around kind of academically that didn't pick up, but I actually really liked it. It's called right wing socialism. So, like, what do we think of when we say socialism? Well, on the left, we understand it to kind of mean a form of egalitarian social systems, control over the workplace, um, horizontaling of society. But there's a certain kind of vision of socialism as a horizontaling for a particular people for a particular purpose. And so, like, not to be cute about it, but national socialism being the socialism for a particular nation. So, okay, we're going to kind of, uh, support the German people. What can we do to empower them, to make them stronger, to feel better, to live better? Um, 
And in a lot of ways, what fascism is, is a critique on capitalism and the existing liberal society by saying it doesn't meet the goals that it's promised. And instead, we're going to kind of offer a new system, one that both kind of validates right-wing impulses, impulses towards inequality, um, but at the same time, really going against the cosmopolitan multicultural world that is also a part of international capitalism. So if the left opposes capitalism because it creates inequality, the right's going to oppose it because it doesn't really create the right formalized inequality. And so instead, their vision of society is one where there's certain people on the top, rightfully, certain people on the bottom by virtue of birth, genetics, or otherwise. And you really need to kind of stratify that intentionally. And so they really have a, a much more complex vision for how the world can be should be structured than kind of the chaos of capitalism can allow, or the kind of ups and downs of markets, or the accumulation of wealth simply for reasons of having capital. Um, and so that's sort of, in a lot of ways, where the far-right vision of anti-capitalism comes from. It also comes from the fact that capitalism creates such dramatic instability and crisis that fascism is the answer to. And so they come at it in a lot of ways from the same impulse that the left does, from reacting to kind of these moments of crisis, from a lot of sense of uh, precarity, of systems falling apart and that kind of thing and trying to create a solution for it. And if you look at capitalism existing and understand that neoliberalism sort of tearing at the environment like we talked about, tearing at social systems, breaking up the family and things like that, things that they care really dramatically about, then they want to find a counter to that. And they have a, a large version of that. I think one of the things that, that has to be understood about fascism, the alt-right, white nationalism in the U.S., even if a lot of those people come out of libertarianism, the only way they come this far is that they leave a large portion of that behind. Um, and that's really a pathway for them. There's a lot of a kind of implicit racialism and liber a lot of libertarianism, but when it becomes explicit, they have to leave certain parts of that behind because there's a certain mythology that exists in libertarianism and about capitalism, that it's fair, it's equal, everyone's treated the same. And they're totally not just giving, getting rid of the capitalist part, but they're getting rid of the mythology. They don't want to pretend that people are going to be treated fairly anymore. Mm. There was something I wanted to get your thoughts on. Um, I've been reading a lot of Anthony DiMaggio's work, um, and he wrote uh, an article for Counterpunch, and it's called The Shutdown as Fascist Creep Profiling Right-Wing Extremism in America. And he did a bunch of uh, polling, and he took poll results. He also, I think, did some polling. And some of the things that he found out through the polling was that he just named off a couple things that it was more like some of these fascist um, ideologies are more like hyper neoliberalism as, as opposed to it's not this myth of blue collar workers. It's more people that are in good standing. Um, and he, one of the things he says is uh, for contempt for checks and balances between the branches of government was accompanied by 26% increased likelihood of supporting Trump. And it was 33% increased likelihood in 2017. Um, embracing violence against perceived enemies was associated with 11% increased likelihood of supporting Trump. Contempt for media freedom was associated with a 33% greater likelihood of being a Trump supporter and so on. But what he ultimately did was add up kind of these, these fascist ideologies, like fascist ideals. And he found that there could be an amounting to a staggering 20 to 25 million Americans that embrace fascist policies. I think he's wrong. I, I, I just, there's a certain thing, line of thinking about fascism on the left that often ascribes it to totalitarian power or simply to kind of dictatorial power, especially when it comes to neoliberal capital, which was really the hyper centralization of capital internationally. Um, and looking at things like the government shutdown and then saying, you know, this strong man that's creating such economic and social crisis, therefore, has this element of a fascist movement to it. And I, I just have trouble seeing that through line. Um, one of the things that's really important to understand about fascism is that it solves a lot of problems economically for a large portion of the population. So this, when he says the myth of the white working class as an agent of fascism, the white working class is an agent of fascism because fascism isn't of itself a form of class struggle. I should, it's a form I should of correct them kind of myself on that. 
he wrote an article saying that based off the polling da- data that he pulled was that so much of the mainstream media was saying it was the white working class that elected Trump, where really it was not the white working class. I actually take a little bit. So I, I, I know what polls what people are talking about, and they often try and point to that, that, that Trump supporters are actually quite more affluent than they're portrayed. That's important. That's true. Um, I think if we look at a broad understanding of class as as the working class of people who don't don't own and control capital, even working professionals that are supporting Trump, I think would be considered a part of the white working class broadly. Um, and so I don't want to get bogged down too much in like what exact levels of income and things like that. I think a lot of people do when looking historically and trying to understand how fascism arises. Is it from the middle class? Is it from the artisanal class? I think I instead would rather look broadly at white people who are non-rich and what exactly they're kind of engaging in. And what we look at something like Trump or we look at like a a more fully fledged fascist movement is that large portions of white workers do that against their better interests because they're given, you know, kind of meek promises like, okay, we'll kind of put you above other workers, basically non-white workers or workers from marginalized groups. And so that's really, really important because what that creates is a mass populist movement. And fascism really rules not just by dictatorial power, but by the mass participation of people. Um, and so that, that those are the kind of moments that I have a bit of a break because one of the things that's really important is that fascism would, if it was to be kind of fully fledged in the U.S., and we say like, yeah, this is really what we understand to be a fascist state, it would inevitably undermine parts of neoliberalism because that chaos of capital isn't command. It's not controlled. And it's not being controlled for a subset identity of people. And that's really, really necessary. And so in a way, the neoliberalism creates kind of the impetus for Trump to then favor workers, except right now he's kind of favoring nobody. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, that's that's fascinating. (laughs) Yeah, I think... uh, I think it, it is interesting when you actually break down fascism um, because I think it often it, it isn't what actually a lot of people on the right really want. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like it, yeah. they, they do want maybe elements of it. There's elements of it that shine through. They're like, okay, that definitely has, you know, elements of fascism. But at least in the United States, it's, it's not quite what we maybe often attribute to it. it. It may be nationalistic. It may be white supremacist. It may be all these things, but it isn't fascism in the proper sense. Right. 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 Yeah. Yeah. And that's what kind of fucks with people's head a little bit because it's really easy to call someone a fascist, <laughs> you know? It is, you know, <laughs> as someone who has written about fascism a lot, I actually cringe a lot when saying it because it's used so diversely liberally (laughs) right (laughs) and you know it's like i came up during the years of bush where it was described constantly bush is a lot of things a fascist he's not that's just not what the word means and so i think it becomes really difficult when we're trying to look at what would a fascist movement take place or how would a fascist movement take place i should say um and who would the people be what would they say what would they think and i actually think it ends up being a lot different and a lot more subtle uh, than we normally expect it to be. And it takes place in moments of really extreme crisis where it draws on a lot of the same influences on the, as the left does, except on a very specific subset of the population, which are essentially being bought out. So do you think that, uh, this is what I hear a lot of people on the left say too, is all the mechanisms are in place, you know, you just need to flip a switch and we're going to be in fascism, like for instance with this government shutdown. If Donald Trump would have declared a national emergency to build the wall, I've read from a lot of people that I respect them saying we've reached fascism when that happens. Um, I think we should back away from that a little bit because whether or not that is fascism or the next stage is fascism or the one after that is, I think we can say where we're at is pretty fucking awful and – we can do something about it now, you know? So, yeah, I mean, as people organize to counter Trump, anything should be done to stop the wall. That's great. Um, if he successfully does that, then people should organize and kind of confront the existence of the wall. Um, and whether or not that really d- is the dividing line, I don't think we should get too wrapped up in that because 
resisting that and you know large issues of, of basically neoliberal capital, massive wealth inequality, climate collapse, all of those should be on the agenda all the time. And I don't want to use one kind of target idea or target date or something like that as saying like, yeah, that's the time when we reached it. That's the time when things change, that kind of thing. Um, it's changing all the time and it's not really changing for the better. So I think we start now, we say that those things are you know, possibilities the, that the world could be dramatically worse years from now if we don't intervene. But I think it's important to just say, like, we are going to kind of uh, be no holds barred in our organizing now and approach it now without worrying too much about exactly what if the next stage is going to be kind of full fledged fascism or not. Yeah, you know, like you said, it's it may not be it may not fit under the definition of, ca- of uh, capitalism, uh, fascism. Excuse me, under fascism, but it's it's still fucking horrible. Yeah, you know, I mean, this whole you know this whole government shutdown. I I have been really disturbed by it. Um, I think it was an article that came out recently, and it was asking like it's like I think it was a uh, it was a Daily Beast or something, but they were asking like. Are anarchists, leftist anarchists, are they happy about the government shutdown? They're like, no. <laughs> like they, You're right. Yeah, like, why would we be? This isn't what we. This isn't what we're talking about, you know. And I think this this idea that okay, there's a government shutdown. This is gonna lead to some sort of um, uh, real resistance or something. It, it doesn't seem like, at least from my perspective, I mean, I don't see anything really coming out of it except obviously there's resentment, there's anger, there's frustration. It does highlight the economic uh, uh, situations that a lot of Americans are in living paycheck to paycheck. If you work for the TSA and you're not getting, I mean, TSA sucks obviously for a lot of reasons, Mm -hmm. but workers are not getting their paychecks. National parks are not being taken care of. People are treating those lands terribly Mm -hmm. because they're not being managed uh, appropriately or well anymore. Um, I, I, I just, I, I think this government shutdown thing is, you know, I, I do wonder, like, w- how different political strains and trends within the country um, are, are going to interpret these types of uh, actions by the U.S. government under Trump. Do you, what, what is your what is your kind of analysis, I guess, of, of what's currently unfolding under the uh, government shutdown? I mean, to me, it looks like the kind of absurdity of capital in a way. Mm-hmm. Um mm-hmm. There's really no benefit here. It costs more money in the end, subtotal. Um, we're talking about over 800,000 people without jobs right now. That's not popular amongst his base. It's not popular amongst the left. It's not popular amongst anybody. Um, I think the Beast article is kind of right on the money. Um large parts of the left that are critical of the state don't see this as the absence of the state because it's not. All the problems of the state are there. It's just a bunch of people don't have jobs yeah, um, and yeah. that forests are getting messed up. I mean, like, that's what it really comes down to. Critiques of the state are much more involved because it goes back to our underlying values and how we want a complete reshaping of society. There's no reshaping of society except that people who normally have jobs are waiting in line to get camp food now. Yeah. And don't you think a lot of people on the left, and I'm not talking about like an anarchist perspective, but just people on the left, it's the critique of the administration of those services by the state that we'd like maybe things a little bit distributed differently, or it's not that we don't want the services at all. And and I think that's where you're pointing to that article yeah. where people are upset. I mean, these are things that, that a lot of people rely on, including you know us. So of course we want some of these things in place and maybe just have a, an honest conversation about what, how they're administered or how they're provided to people. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, they, there's a sort of political volatility to social services where they really fundamentally change. And so if you look at the national park service for a long time, was really pushing forward on making them the vanguard of dealing with climate change, making it a public issue, but also finding ways of managing it, um, managing resources, managing spaces, um, those have become really politically volatile in a different way, you know, and have actually been used as kind of a, a new vanguard against talking about climate change or kind of stigmatizing the discussion of climate change. So in a way, the social services have been kind of politicized away. Um, I think that the, what we're looking at is the shutdown of the elements of the state that we have basically fought to put there. Um, so National Park Service, things that we really, really value, those are the things that are actually coming under attack. Um, 
police departments are not coming under attack. Yeah. Yeah. Um, things that people really find victimizing aren't really coming under attack. ICE is funded. Um, and so I think when we're looking at, at something like the government shutdown, it they really ends up only existing as one that affects the people and not the infrastructures of the state that are incredibly problematic. I don't find anything particularly useful about the government shutdown. Um, it's really, really hard on workers. It's hard on the unions that are representing those workers. And so I don't actually, I find it to be in all possible ways, just kind of undermining. But because of that, there's a large portion of workers who are already organized in the unions and that are, are, are really fundamental to society that can actually find a moment of power here in resisting to go to work and, and finding ways of challenging their workplaces of taking that power back, of being very vocal about it um, and doing so. Um, and so I think that there's a, a huge advantage into those workers thinking of themselves as workers affected by a basically a shitty boss, which is what it is. What do you think the, uh, cause I don't think it's really, I mean, it is partly, I imagine there is a real symbolic, um, importance of building a wall, right? A border wall. Maybe. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, probably a lot that could be said about that, but I, I, as Dar was saying this morning, when we were, we were entering Dar Jamali, it's like, this is a political tool that's being used by, by Trump, by the Trump administration. Mm-hmm. What do you think is the goal of it? I, I find it perplexing. I, I don't I haven't I haven't sat thought about it a whole lot. I don't know what your thoughts are on like why why now especially he could have gotten fu- I think he may have been more likely to get funding under a Republican Congress maybe possibly mm-hmm. yeah. I don't know. I mean now we have more of a democratic control of, of the Congress, right? So I don't know. It's interesting, right? I mean, what what is the... Because I always feel a lot of it is, is, is a lot... I, I don't think people give Trump enough credit as far as being very calculated in some of his decisions. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think there is a certain thing. He understands public relations. Yeah, yeah. And he understands branding really well. Yep. And the wall is great branding for him. It's it like, works really well. It's like that thing with the, the... Because of the government shutdown, he had all those cheeseburgers from all those fast food restaurants. Right. That... Mm-hmm. That was something, you know, that I think people were, like, in, 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 insulted by. But at the same time, I'm like, he knew what he was doing. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think with that stuff, he's really intuitive about it. Oh, and yeah. with the wall, the wall is two things. It's the, his brand, right? Build the wall. People loved that on his campaign trail because it allowed them to say all the things that they had wanted to say and do it all under a politically viable kind of covert language. But it's also a campaign promise. And it's one that was so lofty. It's a big campaign promise. Um, and it's one that I think now he's just, it's being called to deliver on it. He won't really have a base without the wall. The wall rhetorically and politically is his base. That's the fundamentals of what got him elected. So he knows he's going to need that coming up in 2020. And so he has to do something on it. He also got elected by being a strong man. So he thinks that, Hey, if I just go in there and I kick some ass and I kind of force him to do that, then that'll also look good. The problem is that federal workers are also part of his base. So like, it's a really difficult spot he gets put into. So he sees this and it worked in the past. If he just sticks to things, he refuses to apologize. He just says, fuck it. I'm going to do it anyway. It worked. It's why wouldn't it work this time? He didn't listen to advisors before, and it worked. He didn't listen to the media and every political pundit, and he won. Why would he listen this time? So I think there's a certain amount of, like, he's playing through what's won in the past, what he kind of knows to be true in some place, and he's trying to play it to its logical conclusion. The problem is he's he's overshooting it, I think, as far as we can tell, that this is really going to affect his popularity with his base, especially when we're talking about people who aren't going to get um, – uh, government services that are, are going to be part of like the lower income areas of the space in the, uh, you know, uh, the middle America in the South. Mm. Yeah. I just, I just, I'm just having a hard time seeing what the, how this is all going to play out, you know? I mean, cause he's really, I mean, he's like a game of chicken a little bit, you know? I it's, think, I think when, when I, if I was to predict and I'm bad at predicting, <laughs> if I was to predict, um, it would be a slow incremental restarting of the government, you know, yeah. 1% at a time. Um, in a way, I don't know if that's – I mean, I, I want people to get their jobs back, so I'm always happy when that happens. But I think it that's a, that can help kind of erase exactly what he's doing, which is really catastrophic for a lot of people. And by slowly introducing it, it starts to take the heat off of him a little bit. And that's what he's done a little bit is by allowing certain parts of the government to basically uh, start functioning again that could take some of that heat off. But then a certain segment that's not really affecting his base is going to keep going. 
And so, yeah, I think, um, I think we're going to see the slow kind of reopening of it. Um, but I don't know what that's going to do for his wall promise. It, it was the main promise in his campaign. And like you said, it's something that once you've put that out there so much, you can't take it back. You have to fir- hold strong. How are you not going to deliver on your big promise that's getting people riled up to chant this? And now we're seeing in the news with Nathan Phillips, the uh, indigenous activist, the Native American, who they were chanting, these people from Covington High School were chanting, build the wall. And we know that means a bunch of different things. And it's a symbol of white nationalism, right? Oh, and we've seen oh, that absolutely. on display. Yeah. I, 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 you know, there's a, there, <laughs> so we're a few days out from it, right? So we first see these, these videos of these kids. There is no one that didn't have like a giant gut reaction to these like entitled yeah. rich kids with their mega hats mocking an indigenous elder. There is no one that didn't have that reaction. And now people are, a lot of publications are trying to backtrack on the original coverage in light of the larger video, which I don't think exonerates those kids even in the I don't slightest. Think so either. I, I, That's I, what's I can't weird. wrap my head around why there's the kind of softening of this. This is one of the ugliest things that we've seen in kind of the, the Trumpian years that's like an easy video to watch online. It's all kind of like an entire narrative, an entire history, an entire kind of way of being is kind of wrapped up in this video you know the image of very entitled rich white kids smugly wearing their MAGA hats and dancing around doing tomahawk hand gestures just to mock this person um that i mean it's all wrapped up right there and so i think our anger is justified yeah and i you know i think uh vic berger uh he does a lot of obviously very satirical weird videos right where he mm-hmm. you know mocks trump with these, and I think they're very well made videos. They're hilarious. He does a great job of editing. I don't know if you've ever seen a Vic Burger. Oh, video. yeah, he's you, great. Okay, awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, but occasionally he'll do that. He did one on, on uh, Gavin McGinnis back when he was still uh, the, the you know leader of the Proud Boys. He will show, he'll dig into all the archive, all the videos, and he'll lay it out. And I think he did an excellent job with this video he just came out where he shows, he took uh, all the videos that were taken. You know, and shows what happened. Like he shows when those uh, what are they? Uh, these black Israelite. Um, what are they? What are they called? I, I want to. I don't uh, say black any. Hebrew Israelites. Yeah. yeah, and they're like you know they're they're being belligerent as they usually are yeah. um, to this group, and that kind of created these tensions. And then Nathan Phillips shows up, and he's drumming, and he walks towards them. And even within all of that, it, with the whole context of the videos, everything shown from beginning to end. <laughs> it still shows Nathan Phillips as not not being the instigator of this at all. And what's even creepier is now, like when, of course, people are kind of backing off of it a little bit, which is, you know, whatever. But the the, the other thing is, um, because you know this this kid, the, the the smug smirky kid, right? He's got a rich family, right? Mm-hmm. He he had the statement probably concocted in great degree by a family lawyer. Uh, by a PR firm. PR firm. That even, was hired, yeah. Even, wor- and, even and, and worse. I hate to be just so smug and cynical, but you read the statement, and I'm like, I'm sorry, a 16-year-old kid in a MAGA hat did not write that statement. Yeah, no, well, yeah. definitely. And and again, it does show this... Um, it kind of shows... I know this is maybe a big statement, and maybe I shouldn't say it, but it kind of shows what America is in a lot of ways. Maybe I'm wrong in saying that, but obviously it's an incredibly complex thing, America as a thing. But I think that's why it struck that gut feeling because I woke up in the morning and I think a lot of us wake up and look at our cell phones, unfortunately, and we read the first thing and I saw that video and I was like, I'm going to cry. <laughs> like, I don't know what it was. It just hit me. I was like, this is fucked it, up. It is violent rage that kind of swept the country when seeing this. Yeah. I mean, I get it. I get it though. It, I think... There has been this this commentary that it's unfair to put our kind of a sort of traumatic history with kids that look like them onto yeah, those yeah, kids, yeah, yeah. and I understand that totally. The, the problem is that um, they are a part of that traumatic history now, right? Like they yeah. actually are in doing those sorts of things, and so as they dance around, they mock these folks trying to have an, an Indigenous People's Day, trying to share culture, share their experiences, um, and as they do it with such this kind of uh, the entitled 
smugness that kind of gives us that gut reaction. It's really the, a sign of something that's institutional, right? They have the money to do this. They come from a, a really institutionally supportive background. They were brought, they were bust in, right? Yeah, for from Kentucky. A, a, a quote, I mean, I say pro-life with quotations around it, but, you know, a pro-life rally. Right? Yeah, for the for, for Right to Life, a massively yeah. ugly, destructive event uh, meant to basically marginalize women's health. Yeah. Uh, wearing hats, which I think are fairly signs of white supremacy at this point. They're not even signs of Trump support. The MAGA hat is far beyond that. Yeah. Uh, they're chanting MAGA at women passing by. You can see, see cell phone videos of that. So whether or not they approached the crowd or they were just standing there, it really doesn't matter. They still danced around and laughed, you know? And, like, at this point, what do we really need to be tolerant of? I walk through my life trying to be forgiving and kind to all kinds of people. Do I really need to go step out for that? Do we culturally need to really jump through hoops to forgive these kids? Yeah. Um, like, I think that there's a lot of work that has to be done on that side. And this whole thing about, you know, it seemed like they were, oh, they were triggered by these black Israelites. But unfortunately, when you look at videos before that confrontation, if you want to call it a confrontation, but before them shouting at one another happened, they were calling the women yeah. that, that were there to protest their opinion about the pro-life march sluts. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, like I've I've been yelled at by Black Hebrew Israelites. The kids didn't seem phased by it. They're like, "Oh, these weird guys are yelling strange things at us." <laughs> and then, but it, it's it, when they actually had to interface with actual political actors is when it really got ugly, you know. Yeah. And they, I, I think, with the, the the when they were responding to the Black Hebrew Israelites is when they kind of got ramped up into a bit of a fever pitch. But it's when yeah. they actually directed that at sincere people is when that dynamic changed. And I, I know, I mean, the kids are young. They're at, they're you know sixteen year old asshole kids, but that doesn't mean they just get a pass for it. You know, rich white kids get a pass for everything, and why do we have to extend it to them too? Yeah, there is this. I think that what uh, partly what this event shows is that it, it touches on so many different things. One is so many people have been showing videos of their their pep rallies and their games where they're dressed in blackface or they have black paint on them, right? And mocking. Jesus, I haven't seen the. Yeah. Oh, wow. Basketball, a, a team, a basketball team came in there that was predominantly black. I, 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 I haven't seen those. Yeah, I, I've yeah. seen videos of that. Uh, you know, it also ties in. I know that you grew up, you said you went to Catholic high school. And I think a lot of people, for me, I, I didn't go to a school like that. I went to a high school, it's a public school, but it was like that mass group of, of belligerent boys i don't know something just like i think i think a lot of people feel like that was something kind of gross in that yeah yeah you know, it touched on a lot of things and i, I think can, yeah. there are these dynamics that are very frightening in general i think the school pep rally and like that whole kind of vibe yeah. that people have yeah uh you know my wife talks a lot about like being around kind of joking groups of drunk men there's a very uncomfortable experience there's like an unpredictability to it and there's a certain uh-huh. kind of pattern of male behavior and so like even if it's the most well-intentioned nice guys it can be really uncomfortable and i think that's true of like this kind of like school spirit thing they're chanting their school song the kid takes off his shirt for some reason it's dancing around yeah Uh, but it's like it's a space in which they're kind of freed of constraints and able to kind of act almost instinctually and when they do that they behave basically as abusive racists you know do you do you think it's a pampering of a different way like for instance i see a lot of pushback now in colleges for safe you know there's safe spaces and deplatforming and these are trigger words and we can't have you know we can't have that at school anymore and people get outraged about that that they're pampered they're babies where i saw pampering from another way like these people have a pampered lifestyle and they oh, don't absolutely. have a clue and that's where like i got into my reptilian brain and got angry and i couldn't even put the volume up i, I haven't watched it with sound because it would just trigger me too much yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, when people say that they're angry about trigger warnings in safe spaces, they mean they're angry about women and and uh, people asking for rights in public right. spaces. Yeah, you know, like we've had safe spaces for you know veterans with PTSD for decades. You know, we've had trigger warnings. Like you know, I grew up in an area with a lot of veterans. People put out signs when they're going to do fireworks. So if someone had you know combat vet experience, they know that fireworks going to be run. That is a trigger warning by its definition. They use this all the time. It's only when it's you know in a space 
where essentially marginalized communities are asking for support, do they start calling it coddling? What I actually think is coddling is looking at a bunch of kids basically having a racist assault on indigenous communities and saying like boys will be boys essentially and hiring them a PR firm so that they can send out a letter on Twitter. I mean, nothing says coddling like blaming everybody else than your son. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's, I don't know. That that whole thing, it just it just seems like this is a. It's hard to keep up with it, man. You know what I mean? Like I not 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 that it's like. I I've been thinking, and because I do the podcast, I'm always trying to, of course, find out about new people to interview and and keep up with current events and stuff. But man, it it does like. I don't know. This this it just hurts. <laughs> yeah. It hurts the heart, you know. Like yeah. this is it's just it, things seem to be getting to a point, and I don't think it's going to get better, you know. And I, that's the sad thing. And and I don't know. I I just like it, it it hurts him almost. I don't know how else to express. I'm just not really able to articulate how I'm feeling right now. But but doing that this work where I'm kind of constantly engaging with this online media and information being constantly streamed in and i'm seeing this ugliness you know Mm -hmm. people just say well that's just because we live in an age of information right we have the internet we have these phones i can look at things all the time we're instantaneously communicating constantly so you're only seeing what's kind of already been there all the time um it's just now so much more interconnected and so instantaneous that it just seems like things are getting and the, the the tensions are becoming more heightened but i i don't know i think maybe it's kind of both. It's like we've created a feedback loop through using social media and the internet of things, as it's been called, right? That the things that have already existed for so long in this country are now just being reflected back at us at a faster and faster rate. It's reinforcing certain ideological assumptions that certain people have, and they, they get locked into their own. And we all we all do it to our own degree too, right? Yeah, but yeah. it's it's a matter of, I guess, how we choose to um, engage with these this type of information that really maybe sets out certain people apart. Um, anyway, it's just a comment on the time that we're in. It's it's hard. Yeah, I, uh, Hamilton Morris, who who normally writes and about drugs, and, yeah, you know, does this vice stuff, stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. does for vice about uh, drugs. Um, it, it talked a bit about like this, f- the way that the internet kind of journalism functions is based almost entirely on interacting with something that that angers you and really deeply upsets you and that almost it it creates almost like this drug-like experience of like seeking out these emotional kind of um explosions you know like i know myself by reading things that kind of upset me and that uh and I think that there's a, the way that social media does that kind of reinforces that. I am not anti-social media at all. I think that there's ways of doing this um, that are that are much more healthy and, and yeah. do that. But we have to be really intentional about that. You know, I don't, you know, maybe things are getting worse than they were. Everything, like the history of power and capital and those who control wealth and of crisis is one of teetering on the edge. But I think it's how... We're going to live in resistance to that is going to determine how we feel about it because we can't let the story that we have about this be those kids. It really can't. We can't survive that. It has to be about Nathan, the person that was resisting them, or what we do next or how we build relationships while we're doing that work. That has to be the story because we can't just live inundated all the time. You know, If I was to live constantly with climate collapse, like the fear of essentially the end of the world, I mean, Jesus, I was raised you know in a christian church i know about the end of the world it's really frightening (laughs) but instead i want to tell the story of what we've what we are doing what we're trying to do even if we failed at it um that's i think what we need to really focus on and instead if we think of ourselves kind of as the left we really need to focus on organizing building community telling stories and being supportive of each other and let that be our base Mm -hmm. and let the other stuff just be motivating that i mean that's easier said than done but at least that's i think where we should shoot for yeah i think so yeah yeah um i think we had a great conversation i think this is probably a good spot to 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 kind of to kind of end i mean i think we we took a direction at least rob and i weren't really planning on taking uh, at least towards the end there but i think that was a beautiful way to kind of to get at what i was trying to maybe in a very inarticulate way trying to express (laughs) you know it's it's just again it's such an emotional thing and that's that's what's so uh, difficult to try to kind of articulate that but um but shane i you know uh, of course you were the author of fascism today um are there any other upcoming projects or any other things that you're working on that's coming out that we should turn people on to 
Um, I have a number of articles coming out, and I will have a book coming out eventually. I just not Into the ink is future. not dry yet. Sure, so, yeah. sure. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any? I I always try to find things that you've been interviewed for, whether it's a podcast, a publication. Do you have anything like that that people could? point to too as well because i know you get interviewed a lot for various shows and publications um gosh um there was a lot of interviews recently um let's see i have, I have an article coming out in think progress on the burgerville workers union um article coming out in political research associates on the kind of fascist entryism into like local gop um I'm not sure actually about any new interviews besides this one. Um, uh, uh, so I'll have to get back to you on it. So what's your, uh, just if people want to know, because I know you post this a lot on your, your Twitter handle. What is your Twitter handle if people want to follow you? It would be at Shane Burley, at Shane underscore Burley one at <laughs> Twitter. Yeah, they, they make it as awkward on me as possible. And then so. there's your website. It's at ShaneBurley.net. Net, Net. which is a little unupdated until I'm doing kind of revamp on it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was looking at it and I was, uh, I, 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 it's a good spot to like find all your, like your book and everything. Obviously people yeah, want to find yeah. your stuff, but, uh, but yeah, you, you post pretty regularly on uh, Twitter. So I think that's a good spot for people to yeah, find, absolutely, absolutely. find your stuff. Yeah. Well, Shane, thanks for meeting up with us, man. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, thanks a lot for having me. Of course. All right. I think that was good. Hey, thanks for making your way through this discussion with Shane Burley and Rob Simetz. As I mentioned at the beginning of this thing before the before the discussion, uh, if you want to uh, learn more about Rob's work, I'll provide uh, links to his work down in the description. He's a host of the, the excellent program on the Progressive Radio Network moving forward. So go subscribe to his show down below. And if you want to learn anything about Shane Burley, you can go to his website, shaneburley.net. You can follow him on Twitter. And you can, of course, go find his book, Fascism Today. I'll provide links to everything that I mentioned down in the description of this episode. If you really enjoyed this production, if you enjoyed this conversation, please consider subscribing to this channel on YouTube and also subscribing to this podcast on SoundCloud and all these various other platforms. You can find links to all those down in the description. Um, But if you want to support this work, you can do so through either the one-time donation page, which is at paypal.me slash lastbornpodcast. You can treat that a bit like a tip jar. If you liked what you saw, what you heard, please consider throwing a few bucks at me. I would not complain. And if you would like to support this work more regularly, really want to sustain this work, you can do so through the podcast Patreon page. You can go to patreon.com slash last born in the wilderness and there you can make very small or whatever size donations you want a month to the production of this podcast and by doing that you'll gain early access to these interviews these conversations before the official public release that is just my way of thanking my patrons Uh, to my patrons already that are already supporting this work that have already been donating to the production of this podcast i just have to thank you from the bottom of my heart for doing that i know you don't have to and that's why it means so much so thank you so very much. Uh, thank you so much for watching. Have a great one. No weapon. No weapon. No weapon. No weapon.